So the scenario at Indian, uh, if you look at Indian context, then scenario is uh, quite alarming. We are already importing, as I said, roughly around to the tune of around 80,000 crore rupees annually, and uh, it is uh, quite a dent to our economy. And if our farmers are able to boost their production, so definitely this uh, entire this large amount of the money would be going to them. And if you look at last current two to three years scenario. Then we find that uh, you see the process, the prices of oil seed have increased to huge extent. Earlier, the vegetable oils that were selling to the tune of around uh, um, 80, 90, or 100 rupees a liter are now roughly around 150, 160. And mustard oil has there is a tremendous increase in mustard oil price also. So keeping in this view, there is a very large emphasis on by the side of government also from the side of universities also, other researchers also, to boost our oil seed production. And uh, regarding that, this uh, presentation would be there. In this, I would be talking mostly about soybean. Uh, I would be also talking a little bit about rapeseed and mustard, and to some extent, I would be talking about uh, uh, groundnut also. Uh, if you look at our oil seed scenario, then we find that there are nine edible oil seed crops. Uh, nine uh, oil seed crops of which uh, roughly eight are edible. Uh, one is in between safflower, many of us consume it as a good health point, but uh, many uh, there is a differentiation for that. Then we also have got secondary sources of oil seed. Secondary sources basically include roughly your coconut oil, your rice bran oil, and the oil we are getting from cotton seed. So cotton seed is also one of the very good source of uh, oil. And roughly if you look at our scenario of our uh, production, we are roughly producing around 100 lakh uh, uh, tons of oil every uh, every year. And out of that, 70% is coming from these edible oil sources that are nine edible and roughly 30,000 uh, 30, uh, tons are coming from, lakh tons are coming from uh, your secondary sources that includes your uh, rice bran, your coconut seed oil, uh, cotton seed oil and coconut seed oil. Apart from oil palm is also contributing to it. So coming back to the uh, scenario of uh, soybean production. Now, soybean is one of the, you will say, a very miraculous crop. It's also called as wonder crop, miracle crop, golden bean. It's also vegetarian meat. It's a, basically, we all should be knowing. It's a leguminous crop, but we do consider it as an oil seed crop. We do consider it as oil seed crop. Uh, uh, basically, uh, why we are uh, con considering it as a uh, oil seed crop because it has got uh, more than more, uh, more amount of protein is there, less amount of oil seed is there, but we are basically growing it for oil seed. And FAO has also classified this crop as a uh, oil seed crop rather than as a pulse crop because its direct use of pulse is very restricted. It has to be processed for you for being used as pulse crop. Uh, currently, you all should be knowing it is uh, having around 20% oil in it and roughly around 40% protein. Then why soybean? Because we call it wonder crop, uh, uh, because it's uh, having a large amount of uh, protein. Uh, if you look at the biological value of this protein, it's roughly around 74 uh, of soybean protein. Whole soybean, it's 96. Soybean milk, it is 91. And if we compare it with egg or milk, you find it, it's egg is around 97. So soybean is as good as your egg or as good as your milk. Uh, that it is all eight essential amino acids. It's having around 20 amino acids, but all the eight essential amino acids which are not present in vegetables, it is uh, being uh, it is being found in soybean. Now, if you look at uh, its importance in our economy, it's a huge importance. Okay, we are already I have told you importing large amount of uh, uh, vegetable oils in our country from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from Canada. Uh, there is a certain specific countries that are growing oils for uh, for us only. So, if you look at it, soybean, then we find that two third of the world's protein concentrate that is being fed to livestock is from uh, soybean only. The entire Europe, uh, sorry, entire America, South and North grows uh, soybean for feeding it to their livestock after removal of oil. Uh, Fifty six percent of world edible oil is produced from soybean. So we need to see what is the scale of this crop. 56% of edible oil that is consumed globally is being coming from soybean. And it, oil has also got uh, various other uses, like uh, in industrial uses, like in paints, printing, fabric painting. Then lecithins are extracted from soybean oil. That's very important. 
because they are used in emulsifiers and chocolates and ice cream. Uh, without a uh, soybean, without these lecithins, uh, chocolates and ice creams are not being produced. And there is one scenario in India itself, it is that uh, we do not produce ice creams in India. You should be knowing that. We eat frozen deserts. Usually we eat frozen deserts because uh, ice cream has got certain standards that certain milk ingredient has to be there. But in all our cases of our ice cream, uh, they are basically using vegetable oils coming from soybean and other products. So basically we are using a frozen deserts. We very rarely consume ice cream unless and until it would be written it's ice cream. Otherwise it would be written so frozen deserts. So you need to check when you are going for consuming ice cream, look at the packet. It's saying ice cream or it's saying frozen desert. That's a question you should always, always put to the seller, whether you are selling us ice cream or not. Then we also find that it, since it is a leguminous crop, it con contributes to uh, soil fertility by adding nitrogen to the soil. Uh, in the, I will take a one second break. Am I audible? I think, okay. It's okay because once it comes to slide, uh, things are not visible what's happening to it. Okay. So slides are moving. Somebody will reply. Yes, sir. Yes, slides are moving. Oh, oh, oh. I, I will take one uh, after three, four slides. I will ask you because many times we get stuck. Or otherwise, if we are I'm stuck, Madam Swati, Madam will help me. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure. Okay, sir. Okay, okay. okay. So if you look at the plant proteins, then we find that most of the plant proteins are incomplete because they are having uh, either one or more. Uh, there are certain essential amino acids that are not present in them. But then soybean is only vegetable food that contains all essential eight amino acids. These eight amino acids are isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenyl, aniline, reonine, tryptophan, and valine. So you can just see it's a, it's a very important crop. So if you look at industrial point of view, if you look at nutritional point of view, uh, it's already, uh, you just cannot imagine any, anything in the world is not having 40% protein in it. All the pulses are having 22, 24, at the maximum 26% protein. Meat is not having 40% protein in it. Okay, you need to understand in that way. Meat is having 24 to 28% protein in it. So 40% protein getting it from in the nature is it's, uh, just a miracle. You cannot imagine. And that is one of the reasons. Soybean seed is not uh, being infested by any insect. That is the one thing that you need to remember. There might be certain uh, larvae that can feed on the broken parts, but the whole protein seed, or a whole seed of soybean is not being infested by any, uh, any weevil or anything. It's, you keep it, it is going to remain, but then viability is going to decrease. You cannot keep it more than one season. But then if you look at the storage, it's got excellent storage because none of the, due to high oil content and high protein content. Uh, no, no. And, uh, uh, in pulses, we do get a lot of infestation from uh, be beetles, but in soybean, it's a miraculous crop. No infestation from any source. Okay. So different products are being also prepared from soybean, soya flour, soya milk, potted cheeses are produced like tofu, fermented products like tempeh, miso. Basically, fermented products are being used in Japan and other countries, Korea. Uh, I will take one minute uh, to tell you some very interesting facts about soybean apart from this lecture, is that uh, if you look at a global scenario, we find that uh, uh, if you want to live over 100 years, uh, then uh, then the scenario comes that uh, what should be our food, what should be the medicines and all things we take, because life beyond 100 years is uh, very difficult. So what happened that globally, if you look, then we find that maximum amount of uh, persons that are uh, over 100 years are found in Japan. Japan, Korea, these are the countries that are having the very aged population. Uh, and other countries also in Europe and America, they are much more developed or equally developed. But they are finding it difficult to raise the uh, age of their population uh, due to one or another problem. So they concluded, they went on to study what is the reason why Japanese are living uh, to the age of 110, 115, 120. And the conclusion was there that despite the similar medicine facilities and other things, Japanese population is more because they are consuming large amount of soybean in one or another form. So my advice is, is to all of you that if you want to live more than 100 years, you need to also consume soybean in one or another form. So that's one of the very simple uh, message I'm giving to you. If you want to live 120 years, you start consuming soybean as Japanese and Koreans are doing.
okay coming back to health benefits of swaggy so that's it's also has been calcium to prevents osteoporosis improves bone health and other things so, a uh, good source of omega 3 fat, fatty acids uh, cholesterol free lactose free lot of thing lactose free is one of the important things here uh, if you look there is a there is a uh, change in trends in uh, consumption of milk in many countries uh, people are not consuming uh, this uh, cow milk they have started using soybean milk also in our country also those persons who are going into the uh, business of exercising or doing bodybuilding instead of consuming milk they all are consuming soybean milk because it is having high amount of uh, protein and you can regulate the protein content in your soya milk if you want to it's also rich source of other vitamins uh, riboflavins uh, calcium magnesium other nutrients also so coming to its uh, uh, content in it then we find that it's roughly 40% protein oil is 20% weight of that 20% 85% is unsaturated and of that 85% 55% is poof that is good for our health 4 to 5% it is having minerals and roughly that is one question that is being asked in many examination also for the students point of view how much carbohydrate it is having so uh, roughly you can uh, back calculate it out of 100 it's having 40% oil or uh, roughly 20% uh, uh, sorry uh, 40% protein 20% oil so remaining it's already made up of 60% 5% mineral 65% a uh, little, little bit amount of moisture and other things and hull so roughly 30 to 35% is carbohydrate and this carbohydrate is also a dietary fiber since we are having carbohydrate uh, to understand why it's dietary fiber so the carbohydrate present is in the bigger molecules like stachyose and raffinose so these molecules are not digested in our stomach so it acts as dietary fiber and that is one of the reasons so for lower consumption and lower popularity of soya bean because once they are not digested they produce large amount of fatulence that means large amount of gases are produced in our stomach and that creates problem but that is one of the dietary fiber but one of the things that you should be knowing it is having around 30 to 35% protein and that all acts as dietary fiber it's not digested if you look at global scenario where it is produced we find that it is basically produced in america Argentina, Brazil, these three are the leading producers, followed by China and India is the fifth producer, the largest producer. America is the largest producer, followed by Brazil and Argentina, and China is fourth and India is fifth. If you look at the percentage-wise, then we find that United States 32%, Brazil 28%, Argentina 21%, China, India, then Paraguay, Canada, and other countries. Uh, globally it's produced in around 122 million hectare production is around 342 million tons with a productivity of around 28 uh, quintals per hectare but if you look at our scenario then we find that our productivity in india is very low uh, that's why we are uh, we need to go for certain innovative approaches to boost its productivity and if once productivity is boost we will be able to meet uh, our oil demand as well as our protein demand Uh, US accounts for roughly around 32% of world production that's already done Brazil is also second largest producer after US Argentina China then uh, then uh, what's happening globally is that you should be knowing that the entire world uh, apart from India is basically growing genetically modified soybean now what is genetically modified soybean the certain genes from the have been isolated and they have been incorporated into soybean so that it becomes glyphosate tolerant so glyphosate you all should be knowing is a herbicide that is a, a <coughs> total killer herbicide it, uh, it uh, whatever leaves or, or whatever vegetative part it falls it is going to uh, kill that part so in 1994 95 monsanto that is a private organization private company a huge company it has been recently sold off Uh, introduced the glyphosate tolerant soybean not only monsanto introduced glyphosate tolerant soybean it also uh, introduced bt cotton also uh, gts uh, 40-3-2 that was the variety that was introduced and if you look at the current scenario of genetically modified soybean usa is having around 93 to 95 percent area under genetic modification argentina is roughly entire amount of uh, argentinian soybean is genetically modified brazil is also having a substantial amount of area under and in the world uh, average for genetically modified soybean then we find it is 82% of the soybean grown globally is under genetic modification 
and uh, we have got two three genetic modification one is glyphosate tolerant also another genetic modification is for increasing the oil quality uh, that would be coming in the next slide but then what happens that uh, entire if you look at the global scenario then we find that entire euro that is not permitting the uh, growing up of genetic uh, crops as well as they are also not importing anything that has been genetically modified so if you look at the glyphosate residual limit in international trade maximum residual limit should, limit should be less than 20 mg per kg of cake that is after the oil has been extracted the the cake you are having that should be having less than 20 mg per kg of glyphosate in it for its safer uses then we have also got genetically modified soybean for increasing oil stability so the oil stability basically comes uh, due to presence of uh, oleic acid and stearic acid so its content has to increase and uh, currently we are having 8 to 10% oleic acid so that if it is being increased so it the oil stability is there uh, usually what happens is that uh, uh, if oil stability means uh, if somebody is not understanding is that if you keep the oil it becomes rancid it becomes uh, rancid it is uh, it starts uh, smelling foul and its uh, taste also deteriorates with oxidation so if uh, <clears throat> genetic modification is done then uh, by increasing the oleic acid and the stearic acid the quality keeping quality of oil increases so dupont that is another big organization in 1910 dupont and pioneer is a seed company they created a high oleic acid fatty uh, fatty acids in soybean having more than 80% oleic acid normal content is around 23 and it they increase from 23 to 80% so that was a wonderful achievement to because usually what happens that once you oil has been uh, uh, extracted it has to be consumed within 2 3 4 months you cannot uh, keep uh, oil as such in storage so once you get a uh, high keeping quality uh, oil then once uh, extracted it can be kept for over one year or one and a half year So that's a very good for point of view because it doesn't get a spot. Then before we start for actually soybean and other oil seed, we need to also know that uh, apart from uh, <clears throat> genetically modified soybean, genetically modified canola is also being grown. Canola is also one of the oil seed crop. I will take you there. If you look at global scenario, then we find that 50% of the genetically modified crops are uh, is under soybean. 50% 50% of area is under soybean. Maize is having around 30% area of genetically modified crop. Cotton, that is BT cotton, is having 14%. And canola, that is basically a brassica, a mustard group, that is having 5% area. So another uh, crop that is important for our content is uh, context is uh, rapeseed and mustard. And uh, rapeseed and mustard we call it in India. But if you look at uh, global scenario, then this rapeseed and mustard oil is basically in Europe and in America is called as canola. If some of If you go to America or some of you go to Canada, then you won't be getting their mustard oil. You would be getting their canola. So if you get a canola oil, you must not confuse it. We should be understanding it that it's a mustard oil. It is slightly refined there. You don't get that thick oil as you get it in India, but that canola oil is basically a mustard oil. You should also remember it. And the scenario of mustard production, uh, I will also discuss that. Uh, basically, uh, there is a quite a change in scenario of mustard production. Earlier we used to produce. Uh, different there are different uh, rape seeds are there and then mustards are there the classification you will be knowing earlier we used to grow large amount of rape seeds but now the scenario has changed we are all growing mustard that is brassica gins here in large areas so tobacco and soybean is uh, one of the most successful genetically modified crop and it is glyphosate tolerant so what happens that uh, under the soybean production it is a karif season crop you all understand large amount of weed large number of weeds come up and you all would be knowing that weeds are not good they reduce your crop yield by taking nutrients by taking up moisture obstructing sunlight and uh, they are since they are having faster growth habits so they cover the main crop and the main the yield of main crop gets decreased so glyphosate is one of the herbicide that can kill everything but the genetic modification in soybean brings that soybean crop escapes the glyphosate application and rest all the things are being killed so it's a very advantage yes it gives you a very boost in production because weeds are easily managed cost of production also decreases to the huge amount uh, but then uh, there is a issue with glyphosate also 
large amount of uh, cases are against glyphos uh, use of glyphosate uh, and Monsanto as well as uh, uh, the company that has taken over it here, Popsang, that is having a problem. Large number of court cases are there regarding that it is being said that uh, glyphosate is one of the reasons for causing of cancer and our government has also restricted the use of glyphosate. So that's a thing uh, that is still debatable, but uh, still they are growing genetically modified with soybean and that is glyphosate resistant. If you look at Indian scenario, then we find that roughly around 11 million hectare area is under uh, soybean. Production is around 12 to 13 every year. It, it fluctuates a little bit. It is dependent upon rainfall because total uh, soybean grow, grow, grown in India is under rain-fed condition. So if you get a uh, well-distributed rainfall, your production increases. If rainfall scarcity is there, the productivity decreases. And if you look at the major growing states, then MP is the leading state. It contributes something along, uh, around, uh, we can say, 52% of the acreage, as well as a large amount of production, uh, followed by Rajasthan and Maharashtra. Sorry, Maharashtra and Rajasthan. So these three are the leading producer states. Ap apart from it, it's also grown in uh, traditionally in Uttarakhand, little parts of UP, in Ch Bihar also, Ch uh, Chhattisgarh also. Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, and to some extent in Karnataka. A so little bit in uh, northern east states also because there it is a part of traditional uh, diet. Many traditional dishes in northeast as well as in Uttarakhand hills are prepared and in natural hills also are prepared from uh, this soybean. And different types of soybean are there, seed for differences there. The, the, commercially, the cultivated one is always having roughly yellow seed. But the traditional types that are grown in Uttarakhand or in northeast, they are having black colored seed. Uh, brown colored seed and in, in different variations are also there. Green colored soybean uh, is also there. Then there is one of the perfect case to all of you to remember, uh, to know also that uh, soybean uh, crop that was non-existent in roughly around 1970 has become the third most important crop in our country. If you look at the acreage in 1970, it was only 30,000 hectare area. It was in, in uh, entire Indian context, in the Indian uh, nation, it was cultivated only in 30,000 hectare area. Now that's an insignificant amount, 30,000 hectare. But if you look at currently, it's been cultivated in 11.1 uh, million hectare, roughly 1.1 crore area acreage is there. So look from 30,000 mere uh, non-existent crop, it has become the third most uh, acreage crop after rice is the first, then followed by wheat. Then soybean, apart from soybean, cotton is also having similar acreage, around 10 to 10.5 million hectare area, and the maize is also having. But then soybean from nearly non-existent, why it has changed? We were not growing soybean in, uh, till 1970. Since the demand of oil is there, it's totally a demand supply thing. Since demand is there, farmers are growing it and they are, touching, they are getting a little bit of prices, better prices as compared to other crops. So that is a perfect case to know that a uh, 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 mere non-existent crop has become the third most important crop. And for this large effort were done uh, by the Indian government also, by Indian universities also, and we should highly be obliged that Americans also help us to bring out this change. Uh, we have back in 1963-64, uh, the extension advisor to the government of India, he was an American and he suggested that India should be growing protein, uh, should be having a, a soybean as the Indian diet was deficient in protein. So he suggested that the Indian should be having protein as a solution to uh, the protein gap that we are having, uh, having in our diet. So in 1963-64, they introduced a large amount of soybean from America to India and they extensively conducted trials at Pannagar and Jabalpur University. Uh, the trials at Pannagar were very successful. The average yield of soybean varieties that we were that was in America was around 18 quintals, and the same varieties in India yielded more than 30 quintals. So from 63-64, the process started to increase the area under it so that we are becoming self-reliant on oil as well as on protein, as well as our diets become protein sufficient. So the introduction of this from American side helped us. And currently, we we should be we are lucky enough that we are having a good acreage. We are roughly around meeting our 25 
more than 25 percent of our all requirement through this crop so yeah this, this is the what i told you so soybean research in india was a started a solution to protein gap problem 63-64, Mr. Adwin Bay, that was extension advisor to government of India, introduced some varieties at Pannagar as well as at Jabalpur. And in 1966, Bragg and other varieties produced around 35 uh, quintal yields, uh, which was more than the average production of 1800 uh, kg in that was in, that they were getting in MRI. So currently, if you look at different ecological zones where soybean is cultivated, hilly zone that is having a small area, North Plain Zone, again it is having a small area, but Central Zone, that is the major soybean producing zone, MP, Rajasthan, Gujarat, Northwest, Maharashtra, Bundel region of the UP. A little bit soybean uh, is also produced in Southern Zone, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, uh, Southern Maharashtra, and Northeast Zone, where it is a traditional diet, especially in Northern states like Meghalaya. As far as cultivation practices is considered, we also consider Bihar and Assam in Northeast Zone. Uh, before we need to uh, consume soybean, we also need to know uh, what are the major constraints, what are the innovation we need to bring into this crop so that uh, uh, its, uh, its consumption can be promoted. So one of the major production uh, problem here is poor seed viability from one season to another season. So storage of seed beyond one season at room temperature is unsuccessful. Your germination percentage decreases very sharply. And since germination decreases very sharply, so it becomes very problematic. And then lack of uh, drought tolerant varieties uh, because you, you know, I already told you only 0.6 percent area is under irrigation in uh, this crop. So, uh, if there is a abrasion in monsoon, if there is delayed in mon monsoon, or in between there is abrasion, so it creates problem in its productivity. Then, in, inadequate fertilization, uh, fertilization also. Since it is a leguminous crop, it fixes its nitrogen by itself. So to boost this nitrogen fixation, rhizobium culture has to be applied to the seed. And uh, rhizobium culture, since it is a living entity, rhizobium living bacteria are there. It has got a shelf life of three to four months, maximum up to six months. <coughs> so rhizobium culture has to be applied. Farmers do not get very good rhizobium cultures, or there is a lack of awareness between farmers also. Uh, they purchase it in one season and try to apply it in, it in next season. So by that time, the total uh, the colony formation of CFU count decreases very sharply. Very few living um, bacteria are there to get, get you effective modulation. Then another thing is, is since it is an oil seed crop, sulfur application is very essential for this crop. Because you know, you all should be knowing that the application of sulfur not only increases the oil quality, but it also increases your production. So once you have applied sulfur, your oil quality as well as your yield uh, increases. So this is the innovative approach that we need to apply uh, to tell our farmers that uh, you need to apply a rhizobium culture application is must. It's a very, uh, it's not costing much, roughly around uh, 30, 40, 50 rupees uh, cost is there per hectare and yield advantage of around 8 to 10 percent will be there. Sulfur application, uh, we need to suggest them that uh, either you apply some uh, fertilizers that are having sulfur like SSP or you need to apply. These days we are getting a very good fertilizer uh, from different sources that is bentonite sulfate, having 90% sulfur in it. The application of bentonite sulfur is very, it's, uh, since sulfur uh, uh, tint is very high, so small amount has to be applied. Uh, from 25 to 30 kg sulfur per hectare at the time of sowing uh, increases yield. And another problem with swimming is that uh, pot shattering at harvest. Uh, over maturity, if it is left in field, pod start to, starts to shatter, and shattering leads to your reduction in yield. <clears throat> flower drop is another problem in this crop. This crop produces profuse flowering, and uh, the yield which we are getting of around 18, 20, 20 quintals, 25 quintals, they are despite that 75% flowers get dropped from the uh, plant. So if we are able to at least retain a little bit more of that, that is ultimately going to boost our production. So nutrition aspect has to be looked, how to retain this flower. Uh, disease insect aspect has also to be looked to, uh, to retain these flowers and uh, abiotic stresses like moisture or others like excessive temperature that also needs to be looked so that the flowers are retained and we are able to get better production. 
uh, then uh, another thing constraints in swebin uses by uh, us that is basically means that uh, why public consumption of swebin is less in india apart from oil we are not consuming swebin in many other forms we get a little bit of uh, nuggets from a little bit of one or two dishes are there and that is being used currently some traditional dishes are there that are being used in northeast or in hilly condition of uttarakhand and uttaranchal uh, the one of the reason is beany flavor it gives you a little bit of beany flavor uh, that is due to presence of high unsaturated fatty acid especially linoleic acid and lipoxin is enzymes these two are we also call them lox enzymes so lox enzymes and as well as high unsaturated fatty acid leads to beany flavor so how we are going to remove them heat and activation of lox we are boiling it for around 8 to 10 minutes uh like as soon as enzymes get deactivated and another approach to reduce the genetic enzyme that takes time because we need to get new varieties and already are in the process we have already bred variety that are having low yield and in what we maybe see is coming to market उटर basically what happens that if raw swabin is consumed uh, by animals as well as by cows human beings also there will be affected both pancreatic uh, hypertrophy is there and in raw food in the uh, the raw form we get 40 to 45 mg per gram uh, of uh, trypsin inhibitor whereas in process one we get 4 to 8 so how to reduce this trypsin inhibitor Basically, if we are able to boil it for two ten minutes, that totally decreases or checks the uh, content of the soybean. One can also go for for industrial use. One can treat the soybean with alcohol or acid one percent. So that also reduces the soybean is being used in industry. Then many times it is not possible to go for a heat treatment, but then we can go for acid or alcohol treatment one percent. Then genetic modification is also there. Uh, low kinase type line, lines are already there. Low kinase, low KTI lines we call them. Low KTI type lines are also in process. Then phytates, phytates. Uh, uh, the problem with phytates is that comes with uh, uh, certain minerals like I mentioned. This is there everywhere. But then phytates are the source of phosphorus. And uh, phosphorus, you all know, then are ATP, ADP. That is the energy currency of the plant that is being in the ATP forms. So we cannot reduce the phytate to a level beyond. The, if you go beyond the certain levels, then phosphorus content in plant if it reduces, then this is going to reduce your germination and other processes also because plant won't be able to have that much germination. So other way of reducing is that one can go for fermentation of the uh, of the soybean, and this reduces phytate to certain level. or when can we little bit breed certain plants that are uh, low fat levels and if we are able to do, do it then its consumption is going to decrease uh, if someone day is interested i will skip these slides uh, vegetative growth stages for soybean are there and reproductive growth stages of soybean are there we uh, means emergence of cotyledon species unique foliage so if interest can ask my presentation i will share it with them Next like standard, okay. Uh, if you look at its germination, that is one of the major. So, you 
So if they are not able to come out of the soil surface, what's happening? 40% protein is going to attract large amount of microbes, and immediately the composition process is going to start. So it becomes very essential that soybean is shown under proper moisture regime. If moisture regime are are not good, then the germination is going to create problem. Uh, this is V1, V2, V3 stages. Then apart from vegetative stages, we have also got in first flower, last flower formation, last flower formation. The seed is complete and upon mature. So I'll share it. Then production technology, how we are going to enhance it. We need to go for standardization or standard varieties for that are uh, uh, being recommended for certain zones. If you look at the variety that brought the soybean revolution in India, that was JS335, that is coming from Jabalpur. It is the, a variety released back in 1990s, but is still it is having large area. And it is a variety that increased the, that boosted the soybean production and activity in our country. Apart from it, we have got certain other varieties also. These are also very good, and they are being produced in different zones uh, as per their recommendation. The is that uh, basically the seed rate is uh, uh, a little bit here, but it depends upon the seed size. The government can also have more. Uh, Adopsis for them. Some voice is there. Okay. Disturbance was there. Okay. So one can see this interesting should also create a morbidity for the rate of this health chain. This kind of place that is beneficial on that which have found uh, resistance against different other uh, uh, fungi. So in seed inoculation with Brady Rajogin Japonicum that has to be done. Uh, peat based Rajogin culture is best for this purpose and should be used at a bit of mineral rate test for kg per kg per kg. Usually, what happens uh, over the, uh, with uh, with the passage of time, the strength of this culture decreases, but bacteria bacteria size uh, bacteria population decreases. So, if your culture is fresh, go for four five gram per kg. If it's slightly older, increase one. So, basic feed based cultures are there. They are skin color. So, after treatment, it looks like this. These are farmers that are using natural seed, and this is the seed very good. Then we can also inoculate the seed. That is one of the innovative approaches. Phosphate is very much essential for this crop. So we can use phosphate solubilizers and nebulizers. Phosphate solubilizers like bacteria, bacillus, negatarian bacillus, other subtilis, pseudomonas, and fungus like Aspergillus, Sauromorae, Penicillium. Digitatum trichroma can be used. Trichroma, we have already said that we can do this. So, what have these fungus uh, uh, solubilized the insoluble phosphate? Speaking of all, let's pass the malice. Sir, I think you are having some network issues. You are you are not audible. I'm not audible, Sir, your voice is breaking. Breaking. Okay. Yes, sir. Here, this my location. Okay. Till now it was okay. Till yes, now sir. It was okay. Yes, sir. It was okay, but okay. now it broke. No, Still, it's no, okay. Working. Now it's okay, sir. Okay. okay. Okay, then we will continue. So, phosphate solubilizers and phosphate mobilizers are there. Uh, phosphate solubilizers uh, solubilizes your phosphorus, whereas mobilizers helps in mobilizing through increasing the surface area of the roots. 
Now, this is one of the severe, severe problem of uh, soybean that you need to understand that is crusting. After sowing, seeds have to bring these cotyledons above the soil surface. And upon sowing, if it rains, then crust formation is there. And this decreases your germination. Other slides, what happens is you just see there is a thick uh, one inch of soil above the seed. And <clears throat> if these emerging cotyledons are not able to break that crust, they are going to, the rotting process is going to start and this is going to decrease your plant population. So this is the level of crusting. So soil preference uh, for growing soybean should be that light sandy soils are preferred for its cultivation or its sowing should be completed at the when the moisture level is adequate. Crusting does not occur. If crusting occurs, then your germination and your plant population are going to decrease severely. Then, we have to skip. then uh, coming to your fertilizers and manures, that becomes very much essential for growing soybean. Uh, one can apply applying at the rate of 5 to 10 tons per hectare and 20 kg NPK, 20 kg nitrogen, 60 to 80 kg P2O5 and 40 kg uh, K2 along with sulfur. 25 kg, 30 kg and if your soils are deficient in zinc, one needs to apply zinc sulfur that is very much essential otherwise there is reduction in productivity. A uh, starter dose of nitrogen is very much essential for better nodulation. Uh, if we increase the nitrogen dose, then what happens? That nitrogen is the nodulation process get decreased. Nitrogen is nitrogen is activity that is the enzyme that is responsible for fixation that also decreases. Uh, a symbiotic fixation it is producing large amount of uh, nitrogen, to the, providing large amount of nitrogen to the uh, plant. Uh, but uh, if a large amount of uh, additional nitrogen from outside sources applied. Then this, this symbiotic nitrogen fixation, the amount contributed is decreased. So one need not to apply one only goes for basal application of 20 kg nitrogen at initial days, at initial time of sowing. Then if a 2% urea solution is applied at the time of flowering or after at the time of pot formation, it also gives you a good increase of yield by around 10 to 15%. Uh, and these are threshold levels for micronutrients, and then it's going to skip them. A deficiency symptoms iron, you will be getting whiteness in your leaves, magnesium deficiencies are also there. Then one can also apply folio nutrition, specifically if one applies a mixture of uh, zinc sulfate, uh, boron, uh, boric acid, one gets a little bit increase in yield. These are a few of the studies from Andhra Pradesh which suggest you that the yield increase is there. Then uh, apart from it, uh, uh, micronutrient uptake can, uh, also uh, is uh, higher if one, once they are applied. I'm going to skip this. Uh, one needs to remember that uh, boron is a very tricky nutrient. Uh, one should not apply more than what is recommended because once it is applied to slightly more amount, uh, toxicity symptoms are going to appear. So one needs to apply at uh, boron at the rate of one kg boron per hectare. You can have different sources. Uh, Solivo is one of the best ones. Sodium octavoate can be used. So, and if molybdenum is deficient, roughly around 0.5 to one kg molybdenum per hectare. We have got only two sources: sodium molybdate and ammonium molybdate. These are the two sources for application of molybdenum. Uh, water management: uh, the critical stages uh, for its application are basically uh, flowering time. Uh, germination is one of the important thing. Pre sowing irrigation, after that, uh, one at flowering time and one at pot development stages uh, are very good. If, you get, uh, if your irrigation is applied at these stages, you get a uh, good yield. Then, uh, the most important topic for me is the weed management. Okay, because as an ag agronomist, one needs to uh, take it, uh, we take it very seriously because uh, if the weedy population is there, weed population is more, we are not able to get it. I'll give you one scenario. I'll give you uh, one photograph. I will tell you this is the situation of uh, weeds. If this is the situation of weeds. This is one of our experimental plots. Yield levels are roughly, you will say, there is a reduction of roughly around 90 to 95 percent. So, managing, managing weeds becomes very much uh, of our priority. We have got different chemicals. If labor in uh, our farm, are, uh, one is having sufficient amount, one can go for two hand weedings. But since the labors are very costly these days and uh, timely. Management becomes difficult. One should apply different chemicals out there. Among the listed ones which we are seeing, 
And the fourth one that is, uh, sorry, fifth one, sulfentra zone, it's giving a very good result. It is a free emergence. It controls your monopods as well as dipods as well as sedges. Certain amount of sedges like cypress rotundus also gets controlled by application of sulfentra zone. Apart from it, uh, post emergence application of imazithapet, that is at the rate of 0.1 kg AI per hectare, gives you good control over both monopod, dipod, as well as it also checks the growth of sedges surge, also. If one is having more population of monopods that are the grasses, one can apply quizalopod, that is available in the name of Targa Super. One can apply that. Phenoxoprop PHL also gives you control over, very good control over monopods, especially if you are having your cyanodon and other types of grasses. Phenoxoprop gives you very good control. Then we have got also combination products are also there. Sulfentrazone plus clomazone, that is uh, applied as pre-emergence. It is a product from FMC India. They are only selling this at uh, authority next. It is one of the very good chemicals uh, for pre-emergence application. Then post-emergence, one can also ima apply imazithapet, it is imazamox. This is one of the chemical uh, which is applied at 100 grams per hectare. It is available from Basif as Odyssey. Then another chemical that is sodium acyl uh, acyfluorocan plus chlorinopop. Uh, that is, uh, it gives you control over monocots as well as the, uh, broadweed leaves as well as sedges. So it is also one of the post-emergence chemicals giving a very good effect. Infusiflex is another chemical that is from Syngenta. It is having formosifen in it. Uh, and it gives a very quick knockdown effect. Once apply, you apply it at 10 a.m., you will get, the, you will start to see the result after uh, two to three hours only. So within two to three hours, it gives a very knockdown effect, but then the re-emergence of wheat can be there if, if they are not properly managed. These are the few of the chemicals that one should use uh, for getting a good yield of soybean. Now, these are our experimental fields. Um, uh, you can see these are properly managed. Wheat population is less as compared. And these are one of our farmers field also. They are also having a very good soybean crop. Now, these are a few of the major weeds that we found, Trantema, leucine, Amalena. Okay. If you look at different chemicals, how they are affecting, then you find that uh, different experiments have been conducted to say that which chem uh, <coughs> chemicals are much more effective. We find that mesothapal is one of the uh, one of the old chemicals that was very good effective in controlling it. Alaclor has been restricted for its use. It was a very good chemical. Still, it was being used. Uh, for giving a very good control, but uh, now it's not available in the market. It has been restricted its use. So one has to move to other chemicals because it was very cheap. Then I will move to another slide because time, I think time is going to not permit me much. I have to also discuss two more, two, three more crops, Brassica. Now this is the scenario of the fields in, uh, you can say, America and Brazil. How many combines are housing? A very huge amount of fields there. Uh, having so 10,000 hectares in one go, 15,000 hectares in one go. So it is being harvested by combined uh, harvesters also in India also. But in India, the harvesting, <coughs> basically, instead of harvesting, they are threshing it through combines, farmers are. They manually harvest it and they thresh it in combines. So that becomes slightly easier. But at certain places, we have got certain varieties because you have to breed varieties like that so that uh, your pods are not being lost from the, the lower portions. So these are the yield performance of soybean. If you look how many pots are there. One plant can have at least up to 250 to 300 pots per plant and very good uh, yield is there. Uh, roughly, and if you look at the average, we do get up to 40 quintals per hectare. It can get up to 40 quintals per hectare, but the average is, uh, currently the national average is very low, but it's still uh, under good management practices, farmers are able to harvest 20 to 25 quintals per hectare. So I will stop for soybean here, but then we have also got uh, 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 groundnut crop is also there. If you look at groundnut, the problem with groundnut is that uh, uh, it is also got epigel germination. The cotyledons have to come out from the soil surface and uh, bacteria's problem. A lot of bulb damages are also there at the time of germination. And apart from that, uh, the nutrition of uh, groundnut has also to be looked at. Since uh, the shell has to be prepared, so calcium soils are preferred, light textured soils are preferred. And groundnut is one of the crop where flowering occurs on the above soil surface, but pot formation is the soil. So what happens that after uh, pot formation, your gynophore elongates and it penetrates the soil. Uh, since it is having a geotropic uh, movement, 
it goes into the soil but then your soil has to be light adequate moisture has to be ensured and enough amount of calcium needs to be in the soil so that the peg formation and your shell formation occurs uh, so application of sulfur in groundnut becomes very much essential sulfur along with calcium so calcium sulfate is on the fertilizer that needs to be applied in groundnut <coughs> to get the good, good yield uh, since the is a multiple uses apart from oil it is also being used in bakery context and also do consume roast uh, largest producer is gujarat so that in that state it is being produced in very huge amount but other states are also need to pick up and it is one of the alternatives to uh, summer rice also in certain places in punjab also a large amount of area is under summer rice in rajasthan in uh, sorry haryana is there in our uh, western up is there in uttarakhand also the plain portions we are having summer rice so wherever clay content in soil is less groundnut is an alternative crop uh, for some for duration so it in february march you can harvest it before the onset of monsoon and since this crop the we have got different types of uh, plant uh, you can say morphology is there is spreading type is there bunch type is there runner type is there so the bunch type is the one that is being under major cultivation and it is not having any dormancy problem also the other ones are having dormancy problems also the basically the runner ones but the bunch ones uh, the bunch means that the entire pot formation is going to occur in uh, within the main stem within 10 to 15 cm of the main stem that is in one bunch whereas in runner type plants are growing to uh, extend uh, as a runner along the soil surface and they are going to most of the time they produce nodes from uh, the lateral stem also so the plant can uh, instead of being a uh, erect in habit they are in procumbens nature they are in lateral movement horizontal movement so the bunch type of groundnut is since it is not having any dormancy it can be immediately harvested and sown in next crop also that is one of the thing that can be taken up in uh, especially northern india to increase the our oil seed production apart from it uh, we have also got a uh, resident mustard that is the another very important crop for uh, this season and uh, the important thing regarding resident mustard is its a nutrition point of view we need to apply the proper amount of fertilizer fertilizers to get good yield along with the uh, proper application and then uh, insect management in uh, mustard becomes very important because it's a huge infestation of aphids are there and once infested with aphids it becomes difficult to manage it so it needs to apply proper amount of uh, uh, chemicals uh, selective uh, systemic one like imida or we can use acetamoprid uh, and methoxam to some extent these are going to give you good control over uh, mustard uh, sorry aphid population so managing aphid population uh, is uh, uh, easy but uh, farmers usually either one way or another We are not having time, or the aphid population surge in aphid population is uh, so swift or so <coughs> quick that they are not able to manage it. Missing the field for two to three days can result in uh, huge increase in population. Once it becomes over cloudy, as it is these days, two days back, so there the surge in aphid population is there. Uh, so to boost the production, uh, then uh, one thing regarding this uh, mustard is there that government has also given permission. Uh, mid coming years uh, for testing of this genetically modified mustard in india uh, we have man manufactured our own genetically modified mustard uh, permission has been granted but it for it uh, trials extensive cultivation is still uh, i think will one of year may come up but then that is one of the prospects that can boost our uh, all seed production so this uh, i will ask uh, i will stop here i will say that if you are having any questions uh, i am ready to answer that okay any questions on any aspect of all seed cultivation as well as if somebody is interested in uh, uh, analysis of soil and plant nutrients so again you yes, can ask sir. me any question and that also <laughs> because yes sir we have many is, questions uh, the, that is the thing i am doing on daily basis yes sir actually we have many questions from our participants okay, okay. one by one so okay, yes okay. sir I, um, I'll ask first uh, the questions which are in chat box, and then I'll give access to the students so they can directly ask you their questions. Uh, first one is from Tipanchu. He is okay. asking uh, the major problem uh, for our country. Uh, why our country is not self-sufficient in oil seed production? What is the major problem 
uh, that we are facing. Okay. So, the one issue, the issue is that uh, uh, since the most of the all of the farmers want to grow their stable crops like uh, rice or wheat, where they are able to sell it also in the market. Uh, growing oil seed, uh, especially if you take like a groundnut crop or soybean crop, the failure levels are slightly more as compared to your stable crops like uh, rice or wheat. So issue is a little bit like that. Then uh, the yield levels of these crops are not matching the yield levels of uh, rice and wheat. So wherever there is uh, irrigation facilities are not uh, proper, where farmers are growing it. So uh, they are growing it on marginal lands. They are growing uh, their main emphasis is on other stable crops. So uh, they are neglecting these crops also. Insect pest incidents in oilseed crops.